Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we continue with our review of the microwave background and begin our analysis of the Planck satellite. Many believe that this satellite has confirmed the results obtained by WMAP, which we analyzed in these two videos, but attentive study reveals that this is not the case. In reality, the generation of the Planck anisotropy maps has become a data processing exercise with no validity in science. Like WMAP, the Planck results are not consistent from year to year. And as was the case for WMAP, the results from Planck do not even agree amongst themselves, let alone with another satellite. Planck is a project of the European Space Agency supported in part by NASA. Planck operated from L2 until 2013, a total of four years and five months. Much like the WMAP satellite, Planck utilized an off-axis Gregorian design, but in this case, a single primary mirror was used, rather than two. As a result, only one region of the sky was sampled at any given time. The sky signal was received by a 1.9 by 1.5 meter elliptical primary mirror before being directed towards a reflector of approximately 1 meter in diameter, which then focused the signals onto the microwave horns. The satellite housed two instruments. The first was a low frequency instrument, known more commonly as the LFI, which scanned the sky at 30, 44, and 70 gigahertz. The LFI was made up of 22 pseudo-correlation differential radiometers, which compared the signal from the sky with the reference load on board the satellite. In addition to the LFI, the High Frequency Instrument, or HFI, sampled frequencies at 100, 143, 217, 353, 545, and 857 gigahertz. These were sampled using a total of 48 bolometers. Bolometers record electromagnetic radiation by monitoring the heating which takes place in a material through an associated change in resistance. Bolometers are commonly used to sample higher frequencies in place of radiometers. I provide links below to relevant technical papers for those who are interested. In combination, the LFI and HFI on Planck therefore sampled a total of nine frequencies displayed here on a black body spectrum at 2.7 Kelvin. You recall that WMAP sampled at 23, 33, 41, 61, and 94 gigahertz. That decision was made based on the known increasing contribution of galactic signals when frequencies are either much lower or higher. In this video, you will learn that most of the high frequency channels for the Planck satellite are much too filled with galactic emissions to be of any value for cosmology. Now before leaving this figure, I wanted to emphasize once more that this 2.7 Kelvin spectrum has never been measured at L2. That is strange when you think about this issue relative to Planck, as unlike WMAP, all of Planck's channels should have been able to measure the monopole and report its value. However, this never happened. While the HFI should have been able to directly measure the temperature, the Planck team complained that thermal emissions from the instrument itself prevented proper measurements, as you can learn in this paper. Relative to the HFI, the Planck team writes, Planck cannot accurately measure the monopole, uniform part of the emission, because many sources contribute, telescopes, horns, filters. Thus it is claimed that the HFI bolometers, though operating in absolute mode, can receive thermal photons in the microwave from the spacecraft itself, much of which is in a 50 Kelvin environment. As for the LFI, it could measure separate voltages for the sky and the reference loads, but again, no attempt was made to provide a monopole value using this instrument. It is surprising that both the LFI and HFI were able to measure absolute temperature, but neither managed to extract a temperature for the monopole. I might return to this issue later, but for now, in order to judge the merit of the Planck satellite, it is best to simply focus on the images. Fortunately, the Planck mission was a joint project between the ESA and NASA. As a consequence, there has been a public data release and all Planck images can be obtained in high resolution from the NASA IPAC Infrared Science Archive at Caltech, which is linked below. So let us begin with LFI data, examining the 30 gigahertz result in year one through year four as shown here. The first thing to notice is the scale used by the Planck team. 
This scale is logarithmic in nature, and that is an excellent way to hide intensity differences between images, as color changes now represent much larger changes in intensity. Note that the scale is in microkelvin in this case, since the images were acquired at 30 gigahertz. That is the case for all such Planck images up to 353 gigahertz. However, the scale changes for the highest two frequencies, where now the Planck team refers to surface brightness instead of temperature. The fact that the Planck team uses a logarithmic scale is unfortunate, and you recall that the WMAP data used a linear temperature scale. If the Planck data was obtained on a linear scale, it would reveal sky signal stability problems much more dramatically. Still, we can make the point with the images provided. Just keep in mind that the situation is actually far worse than what will now meet the eye. Let us begin by expanding the images for each year and looking at gross features. In year one, the image looks excellent. It is relatively smooth with no streaks. The signal from the galaxy is quite prominent at 30 gigahertz, much like the Ka band in WMAP, but less so than the K band for that satellite. If you expand the image significantly, you begin to see the effect of data processing. As a point of interest, when Planck images are acquired, the number of acquisitions is not uniform across the sky, as you can see in this figure. This is not really a problem, as it is something which can be corrected. Nonetheless, we need to be aware that the number of acquisitions varies within each region and from year to year. Now let us move to year two. In this case, we are seeing a slightly darker band on the image in this region. This is related to the number of acquisitions at each image location, as you can see in this overlaid map. In this case, the Planck team was not able to process out the effect of differing acquisitions. Next, let's look at year three. Now the varying number of acquisitions are starting to be rather significant throughout the images, with some regions masked out by the Planck team. Next comes year four, and the same can be said. You might recall that when I analyzed the WMAP data, I emphasized that in order to judge cosmological stability, images must be examined without averaging. Each year should be examined separately, and fortunately with Planck data, this is now possible, keeping in mind that these images are logarithmic plots. These yearly maps represent temperatures at low frequency, and as such, are directly comparable even if they were acquired using differing numbers of scans in various regions of the sky. So here is the first example, Planck year 1 at 30 GHz placed on top of Planck year 4 at the same frequency. As we did for WMAP data, we can rapidly alternate between the two and find motion throughout the maps. We can focus on a region of the sky with no obvious acquisition differences, and the same can be said. Next, if we subtract the two images, we clearly see that they are not the same, and this is despite the fact that they are presented on a logarithmic scale. The temperatures reported at a given point are vastly changing, yet the subtracted image should be completely black everywhere if this data was indeed of any merit for cosmology. Yet the subtracted image is not black precisely because year 1 data does not at all agree with the year 4 data. The central portion of the image, which had the strongest galactic contribution, was indeed black, but remember, this is because the image is being presented on a logarithmic scale. If it was not, then that region would also not be black. In any case, this result is independent of the number of acquisitions, since we are now examining reported temperatures. Now let us move to 44 GHz, displaying all four images first, then rapidly presenting each in succession. If you wish, you can stop the video on each image for a closer look. Again, we can see some processing problems in being able to fully account for the number of acquisitions. If we overlap year 1 and year 4, we easily find that no stability exists. This can be better visualized if we subtract the two images. Clearly they are not the same, as the resultant once again is not black. Next we move to 70 GHz. Presenting things in the same order, first the images for each year, then the overlap between year 1 and year 4, and finally the subtraction. This brief review of the LFI results 
readily reveals that the maps acquired at 30, 44, and 70 gigahertz are not stable from year to year. However, yearly stability is a prerequisite in making any claims relative to cosmology. This serves to emphasize that the LFI can make no legitimate contributions to this field. At higher frequencies, Planck only acquired data for two years. We can repeat our analysis for each band displaying both yearly images and their overlap, and finally, their subtraction. Here we go. Here's 100 gigahertz year one and year two, then the overlap. Finally, the subtraction. Next, here's 143 gigahertz year one and year two, then the overlap and then finally the subtraction. Next here is 217 gigahertz year one and year two. Notice that as frequency is being increased that the galactic contribution to the image becomes tremendous. Much of the map now has pixels with temperatures well in excess of several millikelvin as can be seen by the red and dark red coloring. Examine also how the center of the galaxy has now increased in intensity compared to the image at 143 gigahertz. That is why the WMAP team had chosen frequencies below 100 gigahertz, thereby avoiding strong galactic contamination as frequencies are increased. Now we move to the overlap and finally to the subtraction. Again, these images are simply not stable from year to year as the subtraction is clearly not black. Now let us examine 353 gigahertz Year 1 and year 2 once again reveal increasing galactic contribution. Next we move to the overlap. Finally to the subtraction. On the surface, this does seem to be better than other images, but if you look closely you will see that these images do not in fact subtract. Now let us look at 500 gigahertz year 1 and year 2 followed by the overlap, and finally the subtraction. And at last, let us examine 857 gigahertz year one and year two, then the overlap, finally the subtraction. In this case, the subtracted image looks very stable, but this simply serves to emphasize that these images are presented on a logarithmic scale. The nearly perfect difference means nothing because the galactic signal is so powerful and floods all the images. If a linear scale was used in the yearly images, the subtracted images would look horrific, as the galaxy is known to be variable in this frequency range. That is precisely the reason why the Planck team does not readily present this data. Once again, a careful analysis of the HFI reveals that the data is not stable from year to year. Moreover, when increasing the frequency, the galactic contribution becomes dramatically more pronounced. Like its counterpart, the LFI, it is now evident that the HFI is unable to make any contribution to cosmology. Our simple analysis reveals that the Planck data is simply not stable from year to year. This is true both for the LFI and the HFI. Moreover, the HFI results were flooded with galactic signal. Given the nature of what we observed, it is clear that the Planck data is not the great scientific achievement that the ESA and the cosmologists have claimed. Indeed, it is simply not justifiable to make any cosmological claims based on such images. In fact, a review of the Planck data serves to dispel all claims that we have entered the age of precision cosmology as is currently advanced by many in the physics community. In the next video, we will examine the generation of anisotropy maps by the Planck team. So hold on to your hats. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.